Looking round, I finally see I think I need a change The rat race I wanna flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free Hello, friends, and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about testing, amending, and, pre- and preparing your garden soil for spring planting. Seems timely, uh, I guess. We got to start thinking about that right now, uh, making our plans of how we're going to do things for when it's time to plant. Some folks, I guess, if you're down south, have never stopped yeah. planting, but for us, it's it's a timely thing for us, and uh, we have to start thinking about it. So, how you doing, Rachel? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. We've had unseasonably warm weather here, which makes me a little anxious to start things that I shouldn't start. Yeah, but me too. <laughs> <laughs> but it has made me start taking a little bit more serious my planning because I have yes. been a little bit behind on things. Same here. Getting things done. So what's been going on in your homestead this week? This week, not a ton. I've been pretty busy with um, work and I have a lot of work coming up. I have two weeks straight of a of work, work, the paid work stuff. And, um, so I haven't done a ton, but I have, um, been going through my large amounts of seeds, which I maybe shouldn't admit to owning so many, (laughs) (laughs) but I have a tall four drawer, um, filing cabinet and three of the drawers are full of seeds. Yeah. So I've been going through those and trying to decide what exactly I'm planting, like what breed of, because I have several different kinds of onions and yada, yada. And then I'm, like I've said before, I'm trying to get more into flowers. So I was trying to Mm -hmm. figure out which flowers, since I'm not well-versed in that yet, that I need to start early. And so it's been kind of fun. Been going through those and clearing out my room to get ready to start my seeds. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's fun. Yeah. I like, I love going through the uh, the seeds and seeing what you got to do the same thing. I'm, I'm kind of trying to, this last few days I've been putting together my seed orders. I haven't submitted them yet, but I mean, I've ordered some seeds, but the kind of bulk seeds for this year, the things I grow the most of, I haven't really put those orders in yet. And I'm actually going to grow some plants for some friends also. So they wanted me to get some stuff started for them. So I'm going to do that for them. And, um, so I've been, yeah, figuring out what to order. And part of that was going through my pantry. I kind of did a pantry inventory because this seemed like a really good time of the year to kind of figure out, okay, what did I not plant enough of? And what do I need more, you know, and, and need more of? And and what do I have too much of? Because there are some things that we don't eat that much, but I like growing it and I grew too much of it. And you end up putting that stuff in your, in your cupboards and they tie up a lot of space and you think, I don't need to be doing so much of that. And so it's like, what do I need to cut back on? What do I need to have more of? So I've been trying to just gauge the pantry and kind of figure that out a little bit. That's actually um, a really good method. Because yeah. I grew too much kale. I dried a ton of it thinking I would use it more. And I have this huge bag left. And kale, even here, can start being grown soon. And so I'm like, okay, less kale. Well, it's like I love beets. And I eat beets all the time. But I'm the only one in my family that will eat beets. Oh, right. And I've got lots of jars of beets. you know. And it's like right. I don't need to be growing so many beets because I'm the only one that's going to eat them. And, and you just kind of figure that out. It's like, well, how much do I have left? And you kind of just try to figure it out. How can I, you maybe want a little bit more than what you need, but you don't need like three times more than what you need. Like I have in beats, but it's things like that, you know, you just try to gauge that out and try to figure out what, what my order really needs to be. Because again, you're just wasting money and time and space in your garden. If you're growing a bunch of stuff that you don't, you don't need, Mm -hmm. um, aren't going to use. So, uh, so there's that I've been doing that. And I got some, I I mentioned this in the Patreon podcast we done last week, but, uh, uh, listener, sent me a link um, for water chestnuts. I'd mentioned a while back that I was not able to find water chestnuts to grow in my pond and stuff. And I was really wanting to get water chestnuts going because I just, I like the idea because they're really productive and I really wanted some and I've never grown them, but I wanted to. And uh, uh, I said, I couldn't find them. I I had trouble finding them. I've been looking for them for a long time and wasn't able to find them. But a listener had sent me a link and said, Hey, Seed Savers Exchange. Here's one person on there. It's got it. And I reached out to that person and 
uh, sent my order into him and it's all done through the mail. I had to mail him a check because he didn't have any online stuff and he's mailing me some, um, some water chestnuts to get going. So kind of excited about that. <laughs> so those are, are the water chestnuts, like the ones that you would buy, like in a can. I think slice? so. Yeah. The Chinese are water they? chestnuts, you slice them and I'm really an, I'm interested. Yeah. I'll be interested to follow this. Cause I love I, those. Things. I'm, I mean, it's kind of all new territory for me, but I've heard so much good about growing water chestnuts that I really, and he gave me the guy that I reached out to I actually emailed him and he sent me back like all the recommendations on how to grow them and how to, you know, storm for the next year and all that kind of stuff. So really helpful, helpful stuff. So That's I'm, cool. I'm, yeah, maybe. And you're going to grow those in your aquaponics. Well, system, I'm going to put right? some in the pond, but I'm also going to grow. I'm actually, yeah, I've got an idea of how I want to set them up in the aquaponics too, but I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket, but right. yeah, I'm wanting to kind of, they actually need to go in soil. Okay. Uh, but like kind of like a river bank type thing where they get wet yes, a lot. Yeah. Okay. So I'm kind of going to have to make a, standing tray in the aquaponic system it'll be kind of in the water but with soil um this so, will be a fun experiment I yeah can't yeah i'm gonna play with it a little bit and kind of get me a good you. setup for it but i do want it in my aquaponic system and in in my outdoor pond too of course i guess you know you have to harvest them refrigerate them through the winter because they can't be frozen and okay. you know so i mean there's a there's some process to it but i'm I'm excited to learn it's another thing i want to add to my homestead that i'm excited about so yeah, yeah that goes i think I think after a while, um, us gardeners <laughs> like to start experimenting on a few little things. And <clears throat> sounds like this is your experiment. For the yeah, year. yeah, one of the things for this year. So it'd be fun. I'm excited about it. So, uh, what do you got for this week's book recommendation, Rachel? Well, this week's book recommendation, I have. It's kind of like it's not really something that you would read straight through. It's the Rodale's Ultimate Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. Yeah, and the reason I like this yeah. is because you can look up, um, say, onions or garlic or crab apple trees, and it gives you a breakdown of the pests that can possibly affect it, the diseases that can possibly affect it, the growing conditions. I like it. It's just kind of like this. It's an encyclopedia of all of a lot of the plants that you grow all in one. And it's just a quick reference guide for um, if you need, if you're having issues and it kind of, so kind of when you have this book, there's two others that kind of can go with it. One is um, on diseases and pests. And then another one, oh shoot. Now my brain is going blank. I have also like disease issues, I think. Is they have one. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, Rodell obviously has written some amazing. They have they got some great, great reference material out for sure. there. Yeah. yeah, I have their composting book. It's one of the ones that Joel Salatin actually recommends. I have not read it. One that one is one that you can read, and I just mm -hmm. I haven't read it yet. But um, yeah. So I like that book. I reference it a lot. Yeah. So That's I actually great. referenced it a little bit for this podcast. So awesome! Great recommendation. Mine is one that. I've wanted it for years. I read it. I got it at the library one time, skimmed through it. Thought, man, one day I want to own these books. It's a two books, uh, two volume set. It's Edible Forest Gardens um, by Dave Jackie. And uh, this year or for Christmas, I actually got them. Uh, one of my I daughters know. bought them for me for Christmas. And and like I said, I got them from the library for and kind of went through them pretty quick. I didn't read them, you know, cover to cover, right. but I've been spending a lot more time in them now that I own them. And, you know, and here's the thing. It's like, if you're interested in forest gardens, uh, for food forests, um, th this is just the only set of books you really need. I mean, they cover everything. It's just a, it's just like the complete set. They are expensive. It's a two volume set. I mean, they're a hundred dollar range, a little bit more, I think uh, just, which is why I hadn't bought them for myself, but I had them. I'm on jealous because I've wanted them myself. <laughs> they are fantastic. And you know, I've always thought I know quite a bit about food forests. You know, I've been studying them for a long time. Yeah. I'm, I'm building a food forest. I mean, but there are things in these books that I'm reading through and I'm going, wow. That, I mean, you just learn every time I pick them up and start reading a new chapter in it. I'm learning new things. There, there's so much information in, in that two volume set. It's just fantastic. And you know what? There's a lot of books out there on food forests and, and forest gardens. But and like I said, this is a, an expensive set. But if you bought all right. them other books one at a time, you're going to spend more than what you would if you just bought these. So you could actually buy these and it's all the information you'd ever need. So I like them. They're great. I recommend them. But yeah, again, our library had positive. them too. So 
and I, That's same thing. Idea. I couldn't uh, get through them. I mean, oh. they, and, <laughs> but you know, if you wanted to check it out first before you decided to spend a hundred dollars, yeah. Since both of our libraries had them, they're probably fairly popular. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what they cost. It's in the hundred dollar range, maybe a little bit more. I, can't I just remember, looked; but... they're about a hundred dollars. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought that's about yeah. what they were, but yeah, like which is why I hadn't bought them for myself. My kids ended up buying them for me because I I spending that kind of money on a you know big item like that for myself. But I love them. I wish I would have bought them a couple of years ago because <laughs> there's so much great information in them. So, well, that. Uh, being out of the way, let's jump into our topic for today, which is kind of testing and amending and preparing your garden soil for that spring planting. I love it. It's the time of the year. We just love getting our gardens ready to start uh, planting. And like you said, it's nice out. So we're really thinking about it yeah, right now. It's hard because I, I still have snow on the ground, which is probably a good thing because I'd probably be tempted to be yeah. out there doing something. So, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean... Some people just think, yeah, my plan, my, my plan is I go out and I rototill every year and I just start popping in plants. But why do you want to maybe spend more time testing and amending and preparing, which pr- rototilling can be preparing your garden soil? There's, I mean, there's some whys to that, why you want to yeah. do it. And one is obviously loosening up your soil, getting it prepared for the planting. I mean, you don't want to work in hard soil, right? You want something that's usable and and, and right. something you can actually plant in. So that's one of the reasons. It's one of the obvious reasons. And tilling can do that. That's not my method generally, unless yeah. I'm starting with a new space, but it can be uh, the way you do it. Um, but yeah, just getting that soil, the right texture is part of it. But what are some other reasons why? <laughs> well, one of my reasons why is, um, you know, if your plants for doing a soil test and improving your soil is for health for yourself and your plants. Yeah. To me, improve, that improve is the soil huge. Health. Yeah. Yeah. Because soil, it, have, it links healthy soil yeah. links to healthy plants, that, which also links to a healthy body. Right. Yeah. And it just makes, um, growing them so much more enjoyable. If you're not constantly yeah. dealing with deficiencies or issues that, and that some of these issues can look really similar and it's hard to figure out which one it is. So right. that's why the soil test is nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, when you get a that higher nutrient density in your, uh, your plants, obviously it's just going to be a, you know, better, yeah. better health for you. Um, I think they taste better too. Yeah. It, it, it's just completely yeah. different uh, produce when you do that way. And, and if you're feeding, you made the point in the notes that if you're feed, you're eating it, but your animals are also eating that, you know, and it's right. the healthier animals also if you're growing feed for your animals. Um, what's left over ends up in your compost and it creates a, a more nutrient dense compost. I mean, it, it just all around, it's great to have right. really nutrient dense um, garden soil and to have soil that's really workable and usable. And that all happens this time of the year, really. I mean, when you're, yeah. And testing, amending, preparing that soil for your for your planting. I mean, it really is year round process. I mean, I do things in the fall as far as adding compost and things too that yeah. contribute to that, or growing cover crops. I mean, there's there's it's to me it's just a it's a all round the year process of just creating this really. Good it is. Soil. I do the same thing. I, I mean, yeah. I do add compost throughout the summer, but this is my main time where I it, like really focus on. Yes. Okay, what's going on and. You know, you and I are both trying to create this full circle on our property as much as possible because we don't want to be relying on the store or Amazon to be delivering things. So, and it it can be um, interesting to do that. But the more healthy our compost is, the more healthy our animals are, the more healthy our plants are, the easier it is to do that. And once you get it established, once you get your soil kind of honed in, which it's going to be different for everybody. Yeah. It, um, it's easier to maintain that. Yeah. And we can talk a little bit about understanding our soil structure because you and I, we, we might probably have similar soil. Yours is probably a little bit more acidic than mine, but our soil is a lot alike. Um, yeah, probably we have that great as far as workable, soil. but you probably yeah. have a little bit sandier, a little bit, um, yeah, more, it's pretty uh, acidic. Sandy. There's probably some differences there, but there's other people that have completely different soil than us. Um, 
So right. we need to understand our soil structure because there's not like a one size fits all thing here as far as amending soil and what you do with it. No. Um, the only thing I do that I would say most people probably do is adding organic matter is always pretty much a good thing to have organic matter in your soil. But as far as amendments, that's going to be different for everybody. And we can it talk is. about a few of the things uh, to look for. And I think you need to understand your, sto your soil structure um, before you can even really start evaluating it. A soil test is good, but there's some other things you really need to understand. Soil composition is Im important. Most plants like a, a loamy soil, which is a mixture of sand and silt and clay and, you know, pretty equal parts. Actually, that's not equal. I mean, def definitely um, lower on the clay on some issues. I think I have a breakdown yeah. down below of what the actual, um, yeah, 20% clay, 40% silt and 40% sand is actually like considered like a perfect soil but it can have a lot of places though it's a little bit more clay a little less sand i mean it, it's nice to have a pretty good balance of all three of those things and we'll talk about in a little bit how you can kind of determine that ph levels are really important to understand yeah my they soil can kind of be all over the place too yeah my, my soil is naturally like great for planting things in except for a few things there's those special plants that like acidic soil like blueberries for an example right love acidic soil um but mine you know most plants like between six and seven pH. Um, so do a pH test and get to know what your, your soil yeah. pH is, because if that's out of those ranges, if it's low, you know, lower than six or higher than seven, it's going to be really difficult to grow things well in that soil. And you will and have to make some are, adjustments. And that's something that you can easily test at home yes. several times throughout the yes. year there. You can buy kits or I'm sure that there's hacks that you can find online. There, I'm there pretty are, sure. Yeah. yeah. But you can yeah. buy kits. Like I put a link in the show notes for a kit that's got 25 tests for NPK and your pH. And um, yeah. it's super simple. They actually have a pH. I actually have a pH meter. I do too. Stick into they're, the, they're, soil. They're, the only thing I don't like about those is they're so flimsy that they break. Yes. They can break so yep. easy. I and and that is the biggest complaint about those things. They do work though. I mean, if the yeah. soil, if you do them right, like the instructions say, they work. But you got to be really careful if you're pushing them in like hard soil or anything because you can break them. They're pretty flimsy. They are pretty flimsy. But I mean, pH. I also put a link for the pH that certain plants like because, like you said, blueberries love. Yeah. like to have that acidic it's soil. really the only thing i have to change my soil for is the right. blueberry area because i just it doesn't grow well in the, my soil i have to add you know some sulfur to it which we can talk about later right. to get it to grow yeah. good yeah yeah so those are and and each piece of property is going to be different i mean i'm only i don't know probably about 30 miles apart from my property and my property has a lot more clay yeah this property is almost was almost all sand when we started. Mm -hmm. That property is yeah. tons of clay. It's just a totally different thing to work with, and you're going to have that all definitely over. Definitely have place. to. You definitely yeah. have to learn how to evaluate that that composition of your soil and the break. So you know right. what you got to add, what you need to add, what you need to change, and yeah, you need to be able to determine that. And we can talk. We'll talk about and that. We'll a bit always in a be learning. I think that um, a lot of it changes. I mean, some of it doesn't change, but you're you're always going to be learning. So don't think that just because Harold and I are here, we know everything about uh, our soil because I still make so many mistakes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, stuff grows learning. pretty well in my soil. But believe me, if, if something wasn't if after a year, I had a really poor year or something and it would just look like I had nutrient deficiencies. I'd be doing the same thing everybody else does. I'd be out digging in the books and lurking, looking on the web, trying to figure it out, running some soil tests, doing all things, which brings us to nutrient levels. I mean, if you're right. lacking in something, the only really way to know that is through a soil test. So if you yeah. start seeing problems in your soil or if it's a new garden area, it's a good, if you're starting a new garden, oh, yeah, it's a good sure. idea to get a soil test. When I first got one, I was really interested in knowing, it was really less about knowing my nutrient levels, I was mo more concerned about to know if there was any heavy metals in my soil because I was, yes, cause I'm, you and I'm I an both urban grow, homesteader. Yeah. yeah. Urban. And you just don't know. Um, so we're close to, I'm close to my house. You're worried about things like lead paint and things like that. So yeah. I did one more for those reasons, but it turned out my, my nutrient density was actually pretty good in my soil. I mean, I had pretty good soil. So I've yeah. only ever done one soil test on my property and for years I've not added anything for that specifically, you know, for the mineral deficiencies or anything. But if you do have nutrient deficiencies, that's good to know because you can start adding the proper things to your soil. So many people add 
things routinely to their soil that they don't even need. They don't have right. nutrient deficiency because they don't even know. They just know, well, it's how dad or grandpa did it and you know, whatever. So I do it too, you know, add the ash to my you know garden or the lime to my garden or the Epsom salt to my garden. Don't do those things if you don't need them. And some of those things you need so little of when you yes. do need them. And they can harm so your of. garden if you get too yeah. much of those things. So again, you don't just add things willy nilly. The only thing I ever add kind of willy nilly is compost. And even that I have a certain amount of that I add. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I had, um, we had major pH issues cause we were growing uh, where our garden wa- is, had large oak trees for years and we yeah. couldn't even grow grass there. So we had some major pH issues, mm-hmm. but, yeah. um, but if you see some problems, it's, sometimes it's just easy to see that and you know, there's an issue now it's time to go test some things. Like if I, again, if I started seeing problems, like things aren't growing good, I'd get a soil test. I try to figure out what the problem mm-hmm. is, you know, and try to figure out there's a deficiency and, you know, phosphorus or potassium or magnesium or, or just nitrogen, which I never, I know it would never be nitrogen because I'm always adding high nitrogen stuff to my garden and certain parts of it, especially, but you don't know on a lot of these things unless you, unless you get a test, you know, and start checking right. for things. So, yeah. And you can yeah. get tests. There's different kinds of tests. You can, I, when I first started here, I got a really extensive test through Logan Labs. Because I wanted to know everything you said with the toxicity. I wanted to know all the little details, but you only have to do something like that. Like when you're starting out, if you want to do it every year, you can't oh, yeah, spend yeah, all that money. For sure. <laughs> um, but if you don't want to, you don't have to, but it is, it does help you know exactly. And like somewhere like Logan Labs, there's probably others. Yeah. It gives you exactly what you can add with organic amendments. And it'll tell you exactly what to add per Usually it's per hundred square feet. Yeah. Which is and, really helpful because you don't want to over lime. You don't want to over, right. you don't want to add too much sulfur. You don't want to add too much Epsom salts. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely overdo it easily in a garden. And, and, and another thing is what you're growing in your area. Some places you're growing, you know, tomatoes and peppers and things. These plants require a lot more nitrogen and things. Right. If you're growing yeah. like lettuce and things, they're not going to require as much. I mean, it's just... It just depends on what you're growing, your yeah, zone, that's true. because there's some things you can't even grow. So you're going to grow for a different kind of plant that, you know, different type of plants that are going to require more of a certain thing or whatever. So yeah, knowing your plants, plants also. Yeah. Certain uh, so. plants are really heavy feeders like corn. Yeah. There's a reason yes. they do corn. And then after corn, they grow beans. Yes, <laughs> I mean, corn is just such yeah. a heavy feeder. Some things will deplete your soil. Uh, mm-hmm. And so on certain you know, th- nutrients. So you might need to add those nutrients in back in the next year uh, to, to get those uh, nutrients back. Um, so also did you want to go through the breakdown? Well, I want to talk about the importance here? of soil structure also, because okay. we talked about composition, like the, the, you know, your sand, your silt and your clay, but also soil structure, having good fluffy soil, you know, having good aeration pores in your soil. This will allow for good uh, um, aeration, good drainage, um, it'll also be, uh, it'll also just do better for retaining moisture for your plants. So it's another thing you'll evaluate when you're just evaluating your soil. Again, if you have the right composition, it'll, it'll assist in that, but also just having a lot of organic matter is a big part of your soil structure. Yeah. So you want to, you want to evaluate that and see, because a lot of what you're adding to your soil is a lot about soil structure. I mean, when I'm adding compost, I'm really like that good workable, fluffy soil because yeah. You know, it's just really good for the watering and the aeration and whatnot of your soil. And it makes and great just, root vegetables. <laughs> yeah. And it's just so much better to work with and plant in. I mean, yeah. I love good garden soil. I love soil. I can just take my hand and kind of push my hand right down into right. it. And Especially I like it when, when it you're like doing that. the no-till method like us. Yes. It, when you have good soil structure, it makes it so much easier to work with. Yes. So you don't have to till. <clears throat> yeah. So here's what I would say. If you, if you have... Say you're you did a soil test five years ago, and um, your plants are growing great. You, great, you've added maybe a couple things. You got your soil great. Things are growing good. Here's what I do: I add compost every year. I'm side dressing and I'm adding, you know, just a little bit of you know, compost here and there. Um, if you're interested in how much compost, like every year, I'm adding compost. Every spring, I add compost to my soil. How much do you need? I actually wrote a. a I feel like a really helpful. A blog post a while back last year on how much compost do I need for my garden? And I have a calculator in there and you can kind of determine, are you, are you adding a top dressing of compost or are you actually going to completely 
amend your soil with compost, which I, the difference for me is when I'm adding a top dressing, it's about a half inch of compost. If I'm um, completely amending my new soil with compost, it's about two inches of compost on top. Yeah, of working you in. add quite a bit when you're yes, completely. When you're getting in. So for me, it's a half inch. But if you want to figure out the size, if you know the size of your beds and you want to figure out exactly how much, say you're buying your compost or you're figuring out how much you need to pull out of your compost bins, I have a calculator in that post. There's a link. I'll have a link in the show notes on how to figure out exactly how much compost to add. Because what I do every year, I add about a half com- half inch of compost. That's a this pretty cool a, calculator. As a I top didn't dressing, know they have yeah. those. Oh, I built that one. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, Look I at actually, you. Yeah, I put the code in there and built that built that calculator. So you can just put in the size of your bed and it'll tell you exactly how much um so much more techy than I am. <laughs> I'm kind of techy, <laughs> yes, I am. But it'll tell you how much to buy. I even have it broke down like how many 40 pound bags you need to buy to to bring home for your uh that's cool. Your, I'm gonna uh, have to use that. Or if you're buying it by the yard, I have a breakdown for cubic yards of compost. If you have a really large garden, that's the best way to buy it. You can just kind of bring home that many cubic ha- yes. yards of uh, compost and put it on your garden. And it'll save you. So, so you know you're buying enough, but you're not buying more than you need and just having it set around. So, um, yeah, use that use that calculator and it'll help you determine. But if you've been using the same space, you've been adding compost to it every year, just add a top dressing of compost. It's really all you need to do. If things are growing good, that's all you yep. really need to do. I mean, it's 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 sufficient, especially with me doing chop and drop, which we'll talk about a little bit as far as adding things. I mean, if you're doing that throughout the year, adding a top dressing every year of compost, there may be a few things that are heavier feeders, like say garlic and, 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 and your, uh, tomatoes and your peppers. And, you know, some of them fruiting things are a little bit more of a heavy feeder. You might add mid season, another side dressing, yeah. Uh, top dressing of compost, and that's fine. You know, they'll do well with that. Um, but that's really all you need to do. But today we're going to dress kind of like you're getting a soil test, and we're going to talk about soil tests yeah. and kind of what does that mean and what do I need to add and maybe some ideas on some things. We don't want to get too far into the weeds because we don't want to overcomplicate it, and we don't want to scare no. you because no. some people can look at that and go, oh, my gosh, this is so just way too yeah. detailed and overwhelming, and I can't do this. Okay, But there's also, like what I put links in, so you can take your soil test and enter it into a calculator that I did not write or make, but I found <laughs> I, I used before online, and it comes highly recommended by one of my mentors. And you can put in all the information, and that calculator mm-hmm. will help you determine what to add to your soil using organic amendments. So, So. yeah. So how do we determine the health of our soil? The number one way is soil tech, get a soil test for the nutrient density and the pH. You Mm -hmm. need to know your pH. Like I said, that isn't as complicated as nutrient density, No, but but it takes more detailed tests to get the nutrient, nutrient density. And you'll follow the instructions on those. You've put some links in the show notes for like some, some places where you can get really detailed, great, um, uh, testing. Yep. Tests. The there are some labs, yep. ones on there are. Like Amazon or whatever. They're pretty good, but you can get yeah. some really high end ones that are way more expensive. Um, that will give you like, like I said, it'll break down, not just the nutrient density, but it'll talk about heavy metals and any other dangerous things that might be in your soil. I'm saying if you're starting fresh, especially if you're an urban homesteader and you're going to be planting yeah. directly in the ground, that might be the way to go right off the you bat. You just don't know what's in the soil. Yeah, you just don't know what you're, you're working or and, even if you're taking over an old farm. Yes. And, but listen, that doesn't mean if you do find things like that, that doesn't mean give up. You can no, build raised beds no, no, no. and yeah. bring in soil. And, you know, if it's that bad where you're really worried about it, don't let that stop you. Like I said, you can you can build raised beds on top of blacktop and have a productive garden. Okay? Oh, yeah. People are doing I, it on do roofs. It. Yeah. They're taking exactly. over sections of cities on blacktop. So, yes. Even if you find some really discouraging things in a test like that, there's there's always another way. And and you yeah. can still have a productive garden. Um, but if you're able to plant in the ground, you're finding out th- these tests will give you some good breakdowns of any deficiencies you have or any problems you might have with your soil. So, you know, and it's important to learn how to understand those nutrient levels and kind of what the ideal nutrient levels are. And, and, and a lot of tests will break it down for you and tell you what the ideal, what, what your range is, where you should be and where you want to be. And some might even go into more detail or you can send it up to other places and actually find out how to fix that. 
we'll kind of cover some basics here, maybe on a few things that you could add that would, that would help with that, but you can actually get some really detailed, um, yeah, you can go, read. yeah, you can go really detailed. I think you, this. I think you put a link in the show notes too, for a place you can send those tests that will actually give you a breakdown of what you need to add to your soil. Right. More yes. of a, yeah. Yep. Okay. That, okay. um, I have Logan labs on there and then the Grow Abundant Gardens actually has a calculator on there where you can enter that and it gives you exactly but what you can you even can pay use. for uh for them to send you a more detailed like you really need to detailed, add this yep. specific thing and this specific thing and they'll give you like a really good detailed list of what you need to add to your garden which in a is really way. nice in a when you're way. yeah starting out and you're just totally lost it's just yes. nice to have somebody I know it costs some pennies but it's nice yeah. to just have somebody tell you what to do yeah. And if that's something you're really concerned about, it's a good way to go. I'm less concerned. I mean, I can see that it's lacking in this or that and add a couple things here and there. And, and I'll take the time and I'll, you know, do it for a year or two. Then we get another test if you feel like you didn't fix the problem and then try it again. If my stuff's growing really great and I'm having a lot of production, yeah. I don't worry about it. It looks good. Now, if you're really wanting to focus on really super nutrient dense food, yeah. You might be more concerned about that and want to increase those things and make sure your food is at its peak when you're getting it, you know, and, and that's where you would be more concerned about those things. Um, so yeah, taking action on those soil tests is important. You paid the money for them, take some action on them. So that's one thing you can do to kind of determine the health of your soil is a soil test for nutrient density and pH. But there's mm -hmm. also some things you can do that are not, um, that won't cost you any money, really. You can just do a soil texture test. Again, I mentioned this earlier. The ideal soil is, you know, it depends, I guess, on what you're planting. But a good range is 20% clay, 40% silt, and 40% sand. That can vary on the clay and, and sand especially. Because if you're in Florida or you're in Alabama, that's going to look too different. You know, clay versus sand. I mean, that's two different things, right? And it's going to take a lot of work to get your your range in the in those areas. But that's kind of like the ideal. Um, you can do what's called a jar test. Have you ever done that, Rachel? A jar I did test? it last year. And yeah, it, it actually works property. pretty good. It does work pretty it's good. It's actually kind of like neat to do with your places kids, and too. It's kind of like this little science yeah. experiment with your kids you can kind of do. Um, this is I how I figured out I have lots of clay everywhere. I had one spot I knew I had lots of clay because it's like hard pan. Yeah. But I didn't realize the whole property basically has a lot of clay. And that's this is how I did it was a jar test. Yeah. You can yeah. take and dig about a 12 by 12 inch square to kind of get your mixture of soil in good. Okay. You put that or no, I'm sorry. You don't have to dig that much. You can just dig down, get you some soil where you're going to plant your garden. I was confusing that with the next test I'm going to talk about. You just dig down, get you a little bit of soil out of your garden and you fill a jar about half with that soil, like a mason jar. And then you fill, fill the rest of the jar up with water. Uh, up to about the, you want a little bit of shaking room. You leave a little bit of a headspace in there so you can shake it up. Um, so just maybe up to where it starts curving, fill up with water. Let it set for just a little bit and kind of soak the water into that soil. Mm -hmm. And then you basically just put the lid on. And you can do a couple things. You can you can do it without or with some dishwashing detergent. The dishwashing oh, yeah. detergent yeah. will just help it separate a little bit. So you can put like a tablespoon of powdered dishwashing detergent in there and it'll kind of help it separate. You don't have to do that, but you can. It'll be a little bit more clear, I think. Um, and you want to also make sure there's not like some big rocks or some wood chips or some sticks yeah. or anything in there. You might want to you might want to shake that out and get it kind of filtered through roots and stuff. Yeah, get that all out of there. Uh, leaves, you don't want any big chunks of anything in there. Put the lid on real good and tight and just shake it. Shake it for like a long time, two, three minutes. Really give it a good shake and then set it down and let it sit. You're going to do a, you're going to check it at a couple different spots. You're going to check it after about a minute. You're going to check it after like some hours and you're going to check it like a couple days later. Yep. Um, really after a couple days, you're really going to see the separation and you're going to have a definite sand layer, clay layer, and silt layer in there. And I put a link in the in the notes, and you, so you get your ruler, and you'll kind of just get your measurements and figure it out, and then figure out what the percentages are on each one of those. And um, yeah, check out that link; it simplifies it, gives you a little chart mm -hmm. on how to break that down. And uh, yeah, and, you'll and if you're using out. this for like a larger acreage, like I was, it's going to differ. Yeah, take some different a little ones. bit. 
Yeah. Yep. Take some, take my some garden's all in one area. So I'm yep. taking it in my garden area. So you can just check that out. And you're in, and, and, you know, as far as getting it back to the percentages, I mean, you, you figure out what you need to add, you know, for different things S- to increase silt. I mean, compost will do that. Topsoil will do that. Um, sand, of course, you, what, what's nice is to add more of like, um, like your, uh, rock, like your, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the word, your rock dust, your rock, rock dust, phosphate. green yeah. sand, things like that might yeah. be good to add for a more of a sand. Of course, clay, most people don't need more clay, but if you're down in like, like I said, the beaches of Florida or something and trying to garden, you're going right. to have a lot of sand. You might need clay in your soil. Um, so it, it might does be help retain add. moisture and it, clay it, it does can, have a its percentage own of it. Yeah, for positive sure. Positive things. Yeah. It holds it together a little bit and kind of keeps it from just being so loose. Um, it'll help with the root structures and things. So, yeah, I mean, just having that nice balance is great. So it will help you determine kind of what you need there. A test that I think is really neat you can do. I've never heard of this before. So I'm intrigued test. by this. Yeah, it's kind of a fun test. Now, you there, I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways. There's a really simple one you can do, which is literally now before you do this test, it, you want your soil to be at least 50 degrees. And you want it to be somewhat moist, not saturated, but not dry either. Okay. Just a, just a moderately moist soil. Um, dig a 12 by 12 by 12 cube hole. Throw that on a, tar- throw that soil on some cardboard or, or a tarp or something, sift through it and count your worms. Huh. Literally count your worms. This is going to help you determine the, or- the organic matter levels in your soil. Worms yes. love. And it's pretty accurate. Like you'll find a lot of like I I found some links to like some some uh, studies that like colleges are doing and stuff on this. So it's pretty pretty detailed. I'm gonna have to try this. Literally take a worm count to determine how good the organic matter levels are in your soil because worms show up. They just show up yeah, when there is good do. organic matter levels in your soil. Here's here's kind of the thing. If you have 31 or more worms, you have very high organic matter. If you have 16 to 30 worms, you have high organic matter. 6 to 15, medium organic matter. 1 to 5, very low. 0, very low. Very, very low. Okay? So that will help you determine. You want medium or above, right? So you need to find at least 6 worms. And the higher, the better. I did this last year. Okay. And had 30 worms in that in that Okay, spot. wow. It was very high, which is great. Cool. You know, you want that. Of course, it's different in different spots in my garden, of course. Um, yeah. But that was- Your a, garden's that, all raised beds, so they are- But are I'm all- up every and down year. and up no, and down. No, they're not all, they're not all or raised oh, okay. beds. Uh, actually, my largest garden isn't raised beds. Okay. Uh, but so, yeah, I'd say that was in the ground is what I took. That okay. had 31. <laughs> had wow. a little less in the raised beds, but- I'm adding organic matter constantly to my raised beds. I'm doing chop and drop and, or to all my beds, I'm doing chop and drop and I'm adding compost yep. constantly. So I have really high, so it's pretty accurate. Um, now you can actually get a more accurate breakdown and I haven't done this, but I found a link and I should have put that link in the show notes. I'm going to go back and see if I can find it of a more detailed test that you can do in this way. And this one actually included breaking down the types of worms oh, that you wow. have. That's because really detailed. <laughs> there are earthworms, there are red worms, which are more of a right. composting worm, and then there are what are considered the deep soil worms. And they're I don't even know, they're just a different type of worm. And there's this link that I that I had had like a chart to determine which had like some pictures and things to determine which worms were which. And they had an app even. You could enter all these into like I found this many of this worm and this many of this worm, and then it would give you the breakdown of your soil. This sounds like um, some matter. of this sounds like really fun science experience yeah, it to get your fun. kids involved into the garden. But how you would do it was basically still dig the hole, figure out those worms, the two kinds of worms, but to bring up the deep soil worms, you filled that hole with water, let it ah. completely drain, and then all of those deep soil worms will rise up and now you grab those. So and now you got the deep soil worms, you got the other two types of worms, you can pick get the pictures and look at what kind of worms you have and then run the run it through the app and then figure it out. I'll find that link and get that in the show notes cuz I fun. thought that was n- really neat and it would actually give you a really accurate breakdown on the or- the type of organic matter you had plus the just have the levels of organic matter that you have. So it could even get way more detailed. Uh, as far as the uh, the type of soil you have. So a fun little test you could do if you wanted to use worms to gauge your soil health. So I thought that was fun. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, I'll get the link in for that one as well. But yeah, soil texture is important. Your organic matter levels are important, but your nutrient density density and pH are really important as well. And you'll have to get more detailed testing methods for those for those kind of tests. But that's how you're going to determine the healthier soil. Right. Um, so what we'll talk about now are just kind of a broad overview of methods for amending soil. This could get really detailed oh, and really yeah. specific. And we just put a few recommendations of things you could use to say adjust nitrogen or phosphorus or magnesium or whatever. So we'll talk about that. But first we'll talk about amending or with organic matter, which anybody that's been listening to us any amount of time knows we that's, talk about that we a lot. We do that a lot. Yeah, like we talk all about summer that. long, I'm yes. constantly doing this. All the things that we talk about, like compost, wood chips, leaf mold. We just did a wet, uh, a whole episode on leaf mold not too long ago, um, or talked a lot about it, rather. Um, biochar, grasses, straw, cover crops, just all the um, organic matters you can add to a garden, right? Um, and I do chop and drop, which is just all those things. You're adding yep. leaves and from from all kinds of things. You know, my com my comfrey and 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 deeply. Yeah, comfrey is polarific, so that's the one that yeah. I add a lot of to my. I'm dropping that constantly on my garden, so mm -hmm. it's not only adding organic matter; it's adding a lot of the nutrients that we're going to we yeah. talk about because it's adding nitrogen, of course, from the leaves and you know all the things that it's reaching down and pulling up from the deep down in the soil. You got a ten foot. Um, tap root on that thing. tap root yeah. yeah it's pulling up all kinds of great minerals that you're dropping on your your garden um so yeah i'm doing a lot of that through chop and drop and and just by adding the organic material your compost has more than just organic matter it's got nutrients in it especially if you're adding a variety of things to your compost yeah. add as much as you can to that thing just keep grabbing it and adding it as long as it's safe and you know that it's not it doesn't have contaminants in it Put it in there. Leaves. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we Rachel bring... and I, we spend a lot of time always talking before we start the podcast and we end up wasting <laughs> yes. a lot of good conversation, but we, we were talking a lot about that in our kind of pre-show show there. We're talking about how we like to really diversify our compost. You know, we grab a little bit of manure from this animal and that animal and, and we grab, uh, you know, different, uh, leaves and sticks and mushrooms and, and, yep. and you know, food scraps and coffee grinds and whatever we can find. And we're adding anything that's good for compost. We're adding it. Why? Because you're getting a complete nutrient profile by doing that. And you're not just having these one or two or three things yeah. in your in your and compost. Yeah, I'm going to be collecting straw out of um, one of the ponds because they're frozen right now. And I'm going to yes. go out on them and cut some of that straw. And yeah, it's not even the, straw. It's some kind of grass. I'm not even yeah, sure what it is. Grab the algae out of there. Grab that. You know, I do yeah, the same thing in my just, pond. I'm grabbing all the, the, the stuff that's growing on add. top of my pond. And I'm throwing that in there. And yeah, whatever. You're I mean, adding just, nutrition and you're adding biodiversity too with yes. all different kinds of little tiny microscopic organisms we don't even really yeah, think absolutely. about when we're doing that. Yeah. Grab it all. You know, throw your leftover vegetables out of your garden, whatever you're cutting away, throw that in there. Throw your food scraps in there. There's some nutrients in that that's getting yep. in there. And when you your gla your, grass clippings, your yeah. Yeah. When everything you add you can that think to of. your compost and you add that to your garden. That's a, a wide range of nutrients you're adding to your garden, which is good. And it keeps you from having to get specific on one thing, like say, oh, I've yeah. got a magnesium deficiency. Well, you're assuming. So you add this one thing that's really heavy in magnesium. Well, that may not even, where if you're adding things in a more general way, these things are very, uh, I would say, slow uh, right. releasing. You know, compost is kind of slow releasing. It's like not overwhelming your garden with any one thing. Release. Yeah. Uh, where when you're adding a lot of these things, like say Epsom salt or something, you're hammering your garden hard with something right. directly. And it, it you don't want to add things like that unless you need them. Yeah. You know? And you don't want to just stick with one kind of compost where you're only adding rabbit poop or you're only adding cow manure. Right. You want to, because those could be deficient too, if they're not getting the greatest diet. You just want as much yeah. diversity. Diversity and is so important. Yeah. And if you're starting with pretty good, say you did your soil test and you're five years in and then things are growing great. The deficiency, what the, the, the plants are pulling out of your garden are going to be most for the most part replaced with compost, mm -hmm. with the nutrients yeah. in compost that you're adding in the chop and drop and, you know, and those kind of things, you're going to be able to add that stuff back with those kind of things. Now, some plants, yeah. like I said, if they require a little bit more nitrogen or whatever, you can get specific. You can throw like some direct animal manure, like some rabbit or not, or not not chicken but rabbit directly um you, you want a cold manure right yeah. or direct cold adding manure. um you can add your green manure like 
comfrey leaves or whatever that's going to that's going to add nitrogen yep. directly some compost tea is great for that if you want to get something a little bit more specific like blood meal or feather meal you know yeah. you put alfalfa. alfalfa in there i mean these are if things that are going to hit your garden with a with a, some nitrogen you know directly and but that's really going to be used more on those plants that are heavy feeders of nitrogen you know your fruit right. and vegetables and things um so you don't need that most of the time let's say you got a test and you see that you need like some phosphorus. You're pretty deficient in phosphorus. You can add things like blood, bone meal. And you add it in your back uh, guana, guana and fish meal for that as well to add. Um, yeah, it's some, not as high as bone meal, but you, it, I mean, it, well, if you just need a small amount. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. apparently willow leaves have it too. So if you have lots of leaves. Yeah, it's new to me, but that's nice to know. Yeah, yeah I looked that up. But, yeah, and you know, and and we're we're mentioning some more organic things you can just add. Yes, right. you could go get a fertilizer that's a like a whatever. A, they got the different numbers for the different things. Your mm-hmm. your certain uh, MPK, things, that, yeah. MPK ratings and stuff, and you're going to add those things. But I like to do things more of a slow release, um, yeah. general, you know, organic method. I have used fertilizers. I'm not going to lie, I've used them. I've used some oh, like, yeah. MPK fertilizers to, to used, get things balanced um, out before. I bought organic chicken manure. I, that was I'm more a fertilizer them, that I more have to use yeah. an actual store bought organic MPK fertilizer in yeah. planters. Like say I got a pot with something and I want to add something to it to feed it. Um I'm more apt to use it in a pot than I am on yeah. my garden. Uh but yeah, I I have used it. Um let's say you need some potassium. Green sand is great. Wood ashes. I mean, that's why you add wood ashes for the most part to to a garden is for the potassium. It's 50% on wood ashes about what it is. Now, with wood ash, we talked about earlier, there's these things that people just add all the time when they don't even need them. Right. You know, know that you need some potassium in your garden or some or some uh, calcium or, yeah, some calcium in your garden because that's what wood ash is going to have a lot of, uh, uh, potassium and calcium. Um, but don't overdo it. Don't add 20 pounds per 1,000 square feet per year max. And that's okay? a that's thousand square you, feet is quite a bit. That's if you need it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you don't need it, you don't need it. That's the thing. Right. You could add a little. It wouldn't hurt. if it, Say you know that your plants were using a lot of potassium and calcium. It's okay to sprinkle that out there, but don't layer it on. I see people that just cake it on there every year. And yeah, you don't quite a do bit. That. Yeah, you're going to you get too heavy that. in potassium. Yeah, and, and if you're using, if you're burning wood, I mean, it's so easy to want yes. to do something with those ashes, but yes. you have yeah. to be really careful. And and having too much potassium or calcium can actually hurt your garden if you had too high ranges of that. So you want to be careful with that. Rock dust is heavy in potassium, so you want to add your rock dust. Like green sand, I think is one, but there's yes. others also that you can add. Um, for calcium, gypsum. A lot of people just add that to their garden all the time whether they know they need it or not. And it's 23%. You know, that's if you need it. You really don't even need it if you're adding cal if you don't know that you have a calcium deficiency. A lot of people will notice a calcium deficiency with like blossom in raw. Yeah, on their and tomatoes. your tomatoes where they get that black yes. spot on that underside. Yeah. And yeah, yep. they'll notice and so they may want to add some gypsum to their garden. But a lot of that is not even the deficiency in the calcium. It's a deficiency in the that's caused because the plants aren't aren't of able to absorb yeah. the yeah. calcium and take it up. Yeah. So there's other things you might have to do um, to get And a lot of times that's because of the soil uh, composition yes. uh, that causes that and the moisture, the ability to absorb the water and, and pull it up. So it may right. or may not even be a calcium deficiency when you have blossom in around. So, yeah. And that's why it's important to keep all of these. That's yes, why they give you the, the amounts and the ratios, because that balance does make yes. a difference. And then why the soil composition? Because if your soil yeah. composition is proper, you're going to have that mycelium de- helping deliver yep. things to your plants. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's a soil food web. It's all working together. Yep. And and if you can have all these nutrients, but if your plants can't take them up, they're not doing any good. And that's why you can't just go by, well, it looks like it's suffering from calcium deficiency. You really need to know if it's suffering from calcium deficiency. Uh, I mean, it is this calcium deficiency in the plant, but do, is your soil suffering from the, the deficiency? Right. Yeah. Um, if your soil isn't deficient in it, you got to figure out why the plant isn't taking it up. And a lot of times, that, like I said, it's a breakdown of, of that soil food web and why it's not being able to absorb it. And you might have to focus on 
soil composition, foil, soil texture, and get that right. Better aeration, yeah. better uh, water absorption, and that will help a lot. So again, it's just taking it all into account. Magnesium is another common thing that you'll see that a lot of people are deficient in. And what do people, if they think maybe they're low or, or they just add it anyway, is Epsom salt. They go crazy with the Epsom yeah, salt. Yeah, need so little. You do, you may not need any. It, most yeah. of the time you don't. I mean, it's not, I've added it a couple times to my garden, but it was around certain plants that are yeah. known for needing ma heavy magnesium. And it did help them, but I, they were doing okay without it. Um, again, you can't overdo that. You can't just add it whether you think you need it or not. Don't add Epsom salt to your garden if you don't need it. It can actually damage the soil if you don't need it. Um, and again, green sand is another thing. Some of your, your rock dust um, ha are heavy in magnesium. I would say rock dust is better than Epsom salt because it's going to be more of a slow release yes. of magnesium, which would be better. Um, sulfur uh, is something that you might want to pay attention to. Again, Epsom salt is big on that. Gypsum's even better on that. So if you know you need sulfur, and why might you need sulfur? If your pH is high. Yes. You want to get your, you want to raise yeah. your acidity. Um, for like things like blueberries or, or certain other, there's some flowers that really like heavy. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking uh, as a hydrange. I can't hydrangeas. remember. I think it is hydrangeas that yeah. like uh, acidic soil. They do. So, yeah. yeah. Sulfur is a great one for, for uh, pH. Um, yeah. now I usually use that. Now I, how I usually get it, I, I buy that Job's organic, which is a sulfur additive yeah. and I'll put that around my blueberries and it worked wonders for my blueberries. Um, and it was able to I've raise used that. that around when pH. we used to have hydrangeas, yeah. I would use it around the hydrangeas, but coffee grounds actually work. Or good I keep too. saying raise your pH it, it, for high pH to lower your pH to raise your acidity. Yes. I guess I, I, yeah. I meant to say, uh, if you got low pH, you want to raise it. You want things like lime or peat moss. I say yeah. lime peat moss is I've had permaculture issues with peat moss because of the, um, the damage it does to the climate using too much peat right. moss. Yes. Uh, it's yeah. the way it's harvested is pretty um, damaging to the environment. So I'm yeah, not a is. fan it of peat is. moss. And there is that cocoa for, core, but that's not well, it doesn't have the pH. The pH. Yeah, it yeah. won't help the pH issue. So lime is a better option there. Again, I know people that just throw lime on their garden, whether they need it or not. Oh, Don't man. do that. I have a, we did that when we um, found out that our soil was pretty acidic. We, yeah. put, we ended up with too much lime after. Yes. Yeah. And that was, you don't want to do that. I think all in all though, considering what you need for your plants is important. The specifics for what you need. Um, and you don't want to get like, yeah. we don't want to stop anybody from starting gardening, but that's why we're telling you to get, you know, your first garden, your first time you dig into the soil. It is nice to get that soil test and then Get the information on how much to put down. Yeah. Because it will give you much more success. But if you're not or you can't, disease. if you're not or yep. you can't, just plant. Just get yep. the soil texture good. Yep. You know, the pH is pretty important. I would say test your pH if nothing else, but that's really simple. There is even a way you can take vinegar and some soil and I think so. there's a foam yeah. test or something that you can kind of help determine. I, I, I'd have to look I that up. It as might well. be baking soda, but I'm but not sure. But if you sure. look, if yeah. you would search Google for a, a home, uh, pH, pH test, test yeah. or whatever DIY pH test. You'll find like some methods for using some vinegar to to test that or whatever. Uh, I say do it and get some stuff planted. And if you don't have a good year, you might. But if things grow yeah. great, maybe don't worry about it. You know, I mean, I don't want to discourage people from sticking no, a seed no, in don't. some soil and growing a plant. I don't want to ever discourage that by making it sound too difficult because no. it's not. We we have a tendency to so overcomplicate things at times. Not me, you specifically, but as people, we tend to overcomplicate things too much, yes. you know. The planet was kind of designed designed to stick seeds in and things grow. We can mess that up. <laughs> of course, climate can mess that up. Things yeah. can mess that up. But for the most part it works. It does. <laughs> okay? It does. And if we um, we just try to mimic that as much as possible yes. and I and yeah, that's why the biodiversity I, yes. and ha having all those the you want bacteria you do not want soil that is devoid of bacteria and worms and bugs the more you can get of all that the more yes. your soil is going to feed your plants because it's all connected all of that is connected and we have sterilized our soil with some of the industrial ways that we do things. Absolutely. The, the idea of the commercial fertilizers and things can just hurt mm -hmm. your soil. Yeah. They'll, they will increase the growth and, yeah. right now. 
but now you're in a cycle where you've harmed your your uh, web, your food web, your soil food web, and now you're either going to have to add, keep adding mm-hmm. that. Or you're going to have to correct it, you know, and, and add the right yep. things and that'll be more of a slow release and correction. And and that's what you really want. You want. Yeah. You're like borrowing from your savings account yes. and we don't want to borrow from our savings account. <laughs> yeah. We want to mimic the natural world. You know, as like I said, as the earth was kind yeah. of, pre- was designed to grow things, you know, and then when it's done in the, when it's done like that, things will just grow. I mean, things just happen. Seeds fall off of plants and fall off of trees and they hit the soil and they plant and they grow and it just mm-hmm. happens. Um, we want to mimic that. We want to do chop and drop. We want to do, we make our compost, but you know what? Compost naturally happens. Things fall, the leaf yeah. matter, the stick. Go to the woods. Think, That's... Animals <laughs> poop yep. in the ground, all that stuff in a compost, right? And, and it just, but we're doing it in our backyards. The only difference, we're kind of closing the loop on our property to make it happen for us. And we're dropping the leaves and we're putting them in the places we want them for us. So they're not yeah. just scattered all over the yard, but we're putting them in those specific putting them in the specific places we want them to have the best soil. That's great. We're helping nature along, but we're trying to do it Mm -hmm. in a natural way and creating that, that system in a, in a more intensified spot, you know, where we're growing things and it works. It works great. I mean, I love doing things the natural way. And again, we can overdo it. Um, but it's really not that hard, especially when you start with healthy soil or if you get to healthy soil, it's really not that hard to keep it that way. And there's certain plants that are kind of, no matter what you do, they just grow really well. And if you're brand yeah. new to this and you're a person that needs success to keep yourself encouraged, though you might want to stick with something like that instead of in some your exotic area. There's some things that grow yeah. really good in your in your zone. Yeah, exactly. Try those things. Yeah, and and then. You know, Instead of trying to grow a lemon tree in zone five, you yeah, might want to grow an apple tree in zone five. Right, right. Like you want some success where I live, stick a radish seed in the ground. In four weeks, you'll be right. eating some radishes. Uh, where you live, it's beans. probably something different. Beans, yeah. I mean, it's just, just like whatever you want to grow. Green I mean, beans just kind of come out of the ground yeah, here. You don't for most really people, for a lot of places. And But you might be in a place where it's something completely different. I mean, you know, if you're in a really right. hot climate, it's whatever grows good in your area. Grow that and have the success. and you know, and then start adjusting your soil for other things, but enjoy the success, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and you can always go and for many years, and I still do sometimes have to, I buy compost. You can still buy compost. Just, you just want to make sure where you're getting it is a good place, but you can buy compost. You can buy soil and and start that way if your soil, like you said, is contaminated and you want to do a raised bed. Or you can even do some of like the Charles Downing. He doesn't even do a raised bed. He just puts some cardboard down and some compost. And he just plants. He, d- <laughs> and he does. He's and got gorgeous success. gardens. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. Kills the weeds and has plenty yeah. of nutrients and things. So, grow. I mean, yeah. if money is tight and you don't want to spend the money on on building a raised bed, you can get some free cardboard and spend your money on the soil. Yeah. Buy some compost and yep. yeah. Last year, what I did was, I mean, I literally did go out there and just rode a till up my soil. I went and bought, you know, cause I didn't have enough cause I added this big garden to my front yeah. yard here. And I was like, I don't have enough compost. I have a lot of compost, but I didn't have enough for that. Right. right? And this exactly. is the first year garden. So I'm needing like two inches of compost over this entire garden. That's a lot. So I went and bought a lot of compost and you know what? I opened the bags. I put a couple inches all over it, and then I just worked it into the soil. I'd already rototilled. I didn't use the rototiller to work it in. I rototilled and got the soil really soft. And then I just went around the shovel and I just kind of turned it in, yeah. you know, and worked it and in. And you with my rented hand. that rototiller. You I didn't buy rototiller one, so it's a one-time one. expense. Yeah, yep. I did that. I worked the soil in with my hands and with a shovel with that compost and got it all worked in there. And then I planted, and things grew fantastic first year on that garden. Yeah. It was yeah. a great garden, you know, so that's really all you need to do. You can, you can make it simple or you can make it more complex. If you're really not, say you've had a garden going for a while. Now you're really wanting to focus on the most nutrient dense food. You can, you can grow, get the soil yeah. test, add the proper things, get the green sand or the rock dust and the, the other minerals you might need, add them in there, grow the best garden you could possibly imagine. Yes. That comes in time though. It does. Um, it does. Compost, a good, healthy compost and organic matter fixes so many things it fixes so, so many, many things. things all by itself let's talk about some of the links that we've added a lot of them we've mentioned already but let's just go through the list of you added a bunch of links here let's well talk about i did some of those. um 
because you were adding so many other things. I just started adding links. So one of the <laughs> things I added, well, I'm going to go backwards here with the first two is okay. Logan Labs, which is, I prefer to do there over my extension because Michigan State extension will, um, for the same price, I can get a little bit better lab mm -hmm. test through Logan Labs than Michigan State. And then if you want to, you can run those results from Logan Labs through a website called Grow Abundant Gardens, and then it will spit back to you and tell you exactly what to put on. It'll give you several options. It will be all organic. It's not going to be some chemical fertilizer. Yep. And then I found a list if people are concerned about pH. I found a plant pH preference list. So it mm -hmm. goes through your more common plants and tells you what pH they prefer. And um, this one I thought was pretty interesting. I found a link that's got pictures, which is really nice because sometimes these deficiencies, yes. especially when you're starting out now, and even me, I have a terrible memory sometimes. Um, it shows pictures of what the deficiencies can look like with magnesium and nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah. It is just a really nice 25 page PDF that that gives you that more visual. And, and like what we said, you know, it say you had a healthy garden or you maybe got a soil test 10 years ago and you've been growing great. Well, now this year I'm starting to see some issues. What right. are those issues? What could they be? Is it time for another soil test? Or maybe can I determine by some, by the look of things, what I might be needing and something like that could be really useful. Yeah. I, I find it really useful and it is nice to see those pictures. I mean, you can, it's hard to describe it visual mm -hmm. or verbally or read it but when you see the pictures it definitely really helps and then i found another one this one is more um it's a list it's actually an article but within the article there's a list of micronutrients and um crops that are sensitive to say boron or iron and then soil conditions for the for the deficiency so it's just it kind of goes through some of those um, talks about which plants prefer certain certain nutrients, which mm -hmm. I found interesting. That's if you like to get into the weeds like me. If this is all overwhelming, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't go there. Um, and then, of course, I have I live in the Great Lakes region where there's some nutritional deficiencies and UFOs, and, evidently. Oh yeah, apparently we have UFOs too. <laughs> that was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday's news um but we have deficiencies we're called the goiter belt because we have deficiencies in selenium and iodine your, your area may have it's like your your area may have a general deficiency it mm -hmm. might be something you want to look up to usually ag places will know that um like your co-op extensions and things like yeah, that might know but it these, too, this yeah. just gives a map of them and what it the map of the deficiency, I guess, because it actually is actually a little bit greater than just Great Lakes. When you think of mm -hmm. like Michigan, Wisconsin, it actually is a little bit wider than that. Basically for iodine, it's if you're not near the oh, ocean. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, and then I have a couple of little pamphlets. I don't know if you call them pamphlets. They're very small books. They're like. Yeah, we, we were talking about those know. before the podcast started. And those like, look like I some mean, handy little pages, books. 30 pages. 30 yeah. pages. And they're great for when. I just think they're great little books, but story has some really good literature. It's the story country wisdom bulletin is what these are called. And I have two links in here. One's for improving your soil and the other one's for fertilizers, making your own fertilizers. And they're just really short to the point and simple. Yeah, they look I bought fantastic. them like 12 I'll, years ago. I will definitely be getting those. I like they look great. They're like three or four bucks a piece and they're just, they're, I think they're really good books. So, and then if you really like to get into the weeds like me and you're maybe a little further down your journey with um, growing soil, which honest to me, that's how I think of plants. Now I think of, I'm not growing plants. I'm growing soil mm -hmm. and my soil grows or my plants grow in that soil, but there's this one, it's called the regenerative growers guide to garden amendments. Um, it's pretty detailed. It's pretty scientific. Um, it's kind of meaty, but that's a fun one if you really like to get into all those gory details. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then I put the simple soil test. It's like those little tablets. I don't know if everybody's seen them, but you just, they're little tablets that you dissolve in water to test your NPK and yeah. pH. They're pretty yeah. simple. It's like 25 tests for all, each one for. You can just do it yourself rather than send your soil off someplace. Yeah. To, if to all you it. want is that baseline. That yeah. If yeah. all you want is that baseline, it's like $25 or yeah. I think it's fifteen dollars for twenty five tests. Let me check. Yeah, you, but, you know that's another thing you get out here with your kids and have some fun doing a little, just yeah. kind of like scientific experiment. Let's find out what the nutrients are in the soil. <laughs> yeah, it's fifteen dollars for twenty of them, and you can get more of them if you want to do if you have a bigger property or bigger gardens and you wanted to do more of them. But th there's also, like you were saying, some home tests you can probably yeah. do. I don't know if you can do NPK that way or not, but. No, probably yeah. not. Yeah, but but yeah. your pH for sure, and your for worm sure. test—that yeah. sounds like a blast. That's I mean, fun. yeah, it's fun to do that one. I want to try the one with the deep worms. I would like to get the more do the more the more detailed one and try yeah. to break out the different kinds of worms and see what it means, you know, to have this or that one. Because like, I cannot you know, see any kid not wanting to do. Yeah, that. I mean, because what you know, different worms would tell you a story, different story, because like an earthworm's right. more of like a topsoil and a and and. and you know, maybe be more about the soil composition of the breakdown right. of silt and where your, your composting worms or your red worms are going to be more about like the actual, you know, organic matter. And then you got those deep worms, which I'm not even sure what that meant, what that would kind of lesson that would teach you, but that would be fun to just kind of see what the breakdown is and see what it, what kind of story it tells you about your soil. So yeah, fun stuff there. I think it'd be yeah. fun. Yeah, so I don't. That's the links I added, and you—you you were mention, probably going to be adding some. Yeah, I'm going to add. I, I said I was going to add the, that earthworm one, obviously, and I did have the one on the compost that I mentioned earlier on how much compost to get for your garden. But I also wanted to add these three books that will help you. Again, as gardeners, we're not just gardening plants; we're gardening soil. That's mm -hmm. really what you're doing. Um, you want the plants it's the end result, but. Right. You're growing good, healthy soil. You're growing a soil food web in your soil. And these three books are fantastic for that. This first one's called Grow Your Soil. Uh, Diane Meisler, I think is her name, um, how you pronounce it. Uh, it's it's one of the more simple ones out of these three, I'm going to say. Really good, though. And and why I say, I don't say simple in a bad way. I say simple as very usable yeah, and understandable. Simple is better. Yeah, yes. it just gives you the basics, but it's also a little deeper than than what you might know in breaking down just all the elements of the soil food web and understanding the process and, and kind of fixing it. Yeah. So um, that's a good, good smaller book of the three. That's pretty good. Um, the living soil handbook we've talked about that one's good, yeah. several times by uh, Jesse Frost. Fantastic book. Um, I mean, this one is out of these three is the most recommended one I have because it's kind of middle of the road. It's not as simple as the other one, which would, is a great book, a little more detailed though, but not near as complex as the next one I'm going to mention. So it's kind of middle of the road one. I feel like every gardener should have this one on their shelf because this is just a lot yeah. of great information in this book. He's a market gardener. And when it comes to feeding soil in the most simple, practical way, he's doing yeah. it. Yeah. And you don't um, have to be a market gardener to like right, that book. Right. Yeah. Just lots of good recommendations. Yeah. 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 Because we're taking stuff. You and I both are planting multiple times a year because we have a small piece of property, which is basically what yes. you do when you're a market gardener. So yeah, we're market gardening right. for ourselves. <laughs> so you're wanting to feed that soil yeah. just constantly. And he's got good recommendations on how to yep. do that. Um, the next one is for these people we were talking about earlier who are really concerned about growing the most uh, nutrient dense food you can grow. Mm -hmm. um, that's this book, The Intelligent Gardener by Steve Solomon, a very in-depth, yeah. um, and literally the, uh, the subtitle is growing nutrient dense food. <laughs> and it's basically going to get in the weeds about everything you need to know about making the most nutrition, the most nutritious food you can get out of your garden. But this is a, this is a science book. This thing is very deep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a meaty book, and but it's good. And uh, every gardener does not need to read this book. Nope. <laughs> you do not need this book. But if you if, like that stuff. Yeah, if you love this stuff, this is the book for you. If if you get intimidated by that kind of stuff, do not get this book. It might chase you away from gardening. <laughs> it might scare <laughs> you from planting a garden. Um, but it is a really good book. Great charts, great information, just tons and tons of information in that book. But I'll put the links for those three as well. Um, in the show notes. So a lot of stuff there. I mean, a lot of things yeah. to consider. 
I keep saying it. I want to say it one more time before we close. If being, if complication scares you away from doing things, don't do any of these things. Put a seed in some soil and grow some plants. If you want to take it to a next level or you just want to continue to, to try to up your game on your homestead, do some of these things. If you want to get super crazy and nutrient dense and you're wanting to go just produce the best quality stuff you can produce take it the, take it there there's all levels in this um, yeah and we were talking about this before cuz you you mentioned that we talk a little bit before sometimes and we're like we should just start cuz we're getting into some <laughs> we stuff say that three good. or four times while we're talking yeah but um you know i'm still convinced even if you just stick it in the ground and you don't do get into all of this you're still going to grow food that's probably more nutritious than when yeah. you're getting at the store because you're picking it fresh and you lose a lot of and, vitamins the second it's picked and gets shipped thousands of miles and, and you and i both feel exactly the same about this yep. the same way about this that if you even have to put mirror like the organic miracle grow on your garden to get a good crop that's better than what you're going to get yep. organic just start in store, just I start think, in my yep. opinion I, yeah. I, I think you could do that and end up with a better quality, more nutritious product than if you went and shopped organic at your grocery store. I, I think yeah. still, it would still be better. Um, That's how I so, started gardening. I actually yes. wasn't even putting organic on. And, um, yeah. you know, you you can just start where you are and start a garden, start a pot. Some if it's just would, one plant. <laughs> yeah, Some people might hate us for saying something like that. But right, at the I same know. time, I, I'm more concerned about people just growing their own food and getting healthy food in their bodies. And it won't be perfect like that. It won't be the best thing you could do, but it will be better than the alternative, which is just going to the store and buying whatever. Well, um, and quite honestly, a lot of the organic food you're buying at the store is still grown by a lot of the same companies. They just yes, have that's what acquired I'm saying. the other organic yeah. company yeah so, so yeah yeah i mean uh, again compost is great it's your friend use it plenty <laughs> and yep. uh and 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 as far as just organic matter in general you know wood chips are great you know cover crops are great all these things are great we talk a lot about those kind of things but yep. it's all just like the icing on the cake let's get some cake going and let's worry about the icing later if that's where you're at if you're already got some nice cake Put a little icing on. <laughs> That's kind of where we're at with it. Yeah, um, just you. It's like you're, you're starting. Everybody has to start somewhere. So s- yeah, just start. Yeah. I we just, just want worry, you to start. I worry we scare some people when we get a little. I know it. And I, I know it. And I so I, sometimes people think, well, you know, he just covers the basics, and there's a reason for that because I, I feel like we are speaking to people who are new to yeah. this kind of lifestyle more than we're speaking to experienced homesteaders. And mm-hmm. those are the people I want to encourage. I think a lot of times the experienced homesteaders that listen to us just enjoy hearing homestead talk. It's not about learning anything. Right. It's just about being inspired to get out there and do things. But there are a lot of new people that are looking like, okay, how do I just get started with this? And those are the people I feel like I speak to more. So we try to keep it really basic sometimes Same. and speak to them. And I, well, and those and are the why- people I want them to start. Yeah. That's why I'm so excited about the growing in a, just in a pot because there is no, there's like hardly any barrier to entry. You buy a pot, you put soil in it, you put a plant in it. Yes. And the same with like Charles Downing method. You don't even have to get a tiller involved. You just get one of your Amazon boxes that arrived at your door and you put it on the ground and you buy some soil. I mean, it's just, and you don't even have to put a seed in that soil. You can literally go down to Walmart and buy a tomato plant plant or something and put it in there and start growing from that point. And and it, you still are learning something and you're you're still growing something. And And in a couple of years, you can start seeds in a couple of years. You can, I mean, you've been growing for a long time. I've been growing for a long time. I just want people to be able to, to start and don't, be afraid of like literally you can start a garden in one day if you start it in a pot or you do that Charles Downing method. So absolutely. So keep it simple. If simple is where you're at, but if you're at the next level, take it to the next level because it can get better. It can get better and better. I mean, I still have so much improving I can do in my own garden and I'm learning, I'm learning things every day. I was talking about the edible food forest books at the beginning. And I was talking about how, you know, I think I have a grasp on like these things. And then I read those books. I'm going, wow, I don't know anything, (laughs) you know, compared to what what we think we know now, 10 years from now, there'll be new science and new thoughts and and new. Yeah. yeah. We're always learning. We're always growing and changing. And, and you know what? 
I, there's things I say on this podcast now that I wouldn't have said five years ago, right. or I've say, or I say something completely different now than I said five years ago. I'm always yeah. leery about when t- people tell me, Hey, I just found your podcast and I'm starting from the beginning and I'm going, You're Oh like, no, oh. no, start from now work backwards. Cause there's things I say now that I would not have said back then, or I said completely different back then. And we grow and that's kind of the danger of things like a podcast because you know, it's out there, you know, and if somebody's starting from the beginning and they're working through it slowly, they may be making some of the same mistakes I made early on, uh, that I don't make now, you know, and I'm sharing those things as if right. this is the way back then, which it may not be, you know, and, 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 and it may be the case today. We might say things today that, so we're not, don't take everything we say, um, no. as just the gospel. I mean, do your own research on all these things because you know, and share with us. If you learn that we're wrong about something, come back, you know, don't just say, oh no, you're wrong, but show us some research or something that might change our minds because right. I love learning new things and I love yeah, and correcting I don't, my mistakes. You know, our but podcast it, is not so much about us being experts. It's about us hopefully bringing people that know more about it and I, sharing with you people like, um, John Kempf, who was the, uh, forward to the one book and he's just like crazy into the science. I mean, there's people out there that are so crazy into the science. Elaine Ingram is another one. We're just trying to encourage you all to homestead and garden and bringing experts and mentioning experts. So you guys can go and learn it all. Every time we sit down to this podcast and I hit record, it's with complete humility because I'm almost yes. scared that I'm going to say something that's either going to turn somebody have, away yeah. or lead them in the wrong way. And, and I'm careful about that. But at the same time, I just put the warning out there, you know, that yeah. we're, we are people who garden homestead and we both work jobs. We're just ordinary people. You know, we, we yeah. not, this isn't even what we do for a full-time living at this point. We in our just lives. love it. That's we all. love we it. We love enjoy it. it. And, uh, we, we try to guide you a little bit and take you mm-hmm. down some of the paths we go down, but there may be a better way. And I guess we're spending too much time on this, trying to do too right. much of the we're beating uh, a dead horse. <laughs> privacy uh, balls here. Uh, you know, let me throw some terms and conditions out there, you know, but anyway, <laughs> right. That's what we're, that's where we're coming to you from. But we just want you to grow something and, and have enjoyable, healthy food and um and have fun doing it too. I mean, don't oh yeah, this can get be so much fun out with kids this, and uh, grandkids and yeah. I, there's this there's a person that I see their posts occasionally that they're they're kind of new to it and they seem stressed out because they're always asking these questions. They yeah. seem overly stressed about all the questions they're asking. And I'm thinking they're not having no fun with this. <laughs> You need to be yeah, having enjoy more fun. it. Have fun. Enjoy it. Yeah. And if things, you know what, if your plants die, yes, yeah, so you waste a little bit of money, a little bit of time, but you'll learn from that. It's a learning process and you got to spend some time trying to grow some things and you'll learn better and you'll grow better next time, but just enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. I mean, I got into this for the health reasons and I wanted healthy food, but I tell you what, the fun of it and the enjoyment of it is what keeps, I think more than mm-hmm. anything keeps me coming back to it every year, you know? Because I could buy, I could go down and buy it from somebody doing it just like I would do it. Yeah. But I, but it's so much more fun to do it myself. <laughs> it is. And it's rewarding. It and is. you, you get to spend time now with your grandkids in the garden. And yeah, um, yeah. that's love, fun to always, I love, I love having there. the kids in the garden. That's yeah. like, oh, I love that. Yeah. And, and like I, I said, we're that. talking about some of these little fun tests you can do and stuff, man, get the kids out there. and They'll love that kind of stuff. And it'll, and you know what, it will spark an interest in them that will build a legacy of gardening and homesteading for them. I mean, it'll just, you know, things I did when I was a kid, I remember, you know, the first thing I ever grew myself, like we had gardens growing up. And, um, uh, and so I, I knew about gardening and stuff. We just went out there and did it and it wasn't very much fun. I remember though, like planting a bean seed in a class at school and you, you know, you get a little star foam cup and and we're going to grow this. Right. And for some reason, that embedded in me a love for gardening, doing right. that in a class, because that yeah. was my bean seed. This wasn't mom and dad's garden that I was working in. This was my bean seed that I grew in class. And now I got a plant and I took it home and I planted it in the garden. And then we got beans from it. Yeah, and that's that's cool. It, and the kids it, love that yeah, stuff. It just ingrained in me a love for growing things, even as a kid that I'm glad I came back to later in my life. So do things like that with your kids, give them a little section of the garden, get out there and do the worm test and the, the different soil tests and stuff with them, because that will just, it will, 
it will just yeah. put something in them that they may not, they may get away from it even as adults, but they may come back to it later in their life. They'll remember that. Yeah. That's what my husband, he got away from it for a while yeah. and, and now he's loving yeah, he it did. and he's back at it. Yeah. So, so yeah, just want to throw that in there, folks. I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I thought it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I did too. Until next week, happy homesteading. God bless. And grow where you're planted. Looking around, I finally see I think I need a change. The rat race I want to flee My world I'll rearrange I'm getting back to the roots Of how it's meant to be Growing gardens, picking fruit Racing livestock, living free It's a Like grandma did, sitting on her front porch, hunting and fishing like a kid. Once you've done all of your chores, it's a modern homestead. Build a modern homestead. Country or city, there's a way to make this change. You got. Today